Good evening. Good evening. You can all hear me. Now, I think there's a lot more of you in here than was intended. I think the plan was to have uh, people book and then come in, but the council has decided to uh, to let you all in. It does make a, a big number here, so we need to be fairly well organised and fairly well disciplined. Now, there are, of course, exits here. Should there be any any problems? There's, I'll do my easy jet here. There's two, there's two here, but the other two are behind the people who are standing in the aisles, so just be, care, just be careful about that. Okay. My name is Steve Lowe. I'm chairing the uh, evening. I'm independent, as it were, and I'm actually a group editor of LSN Media, which includes Bedfordshire on Sunday and Luton on Sunday. I've got four people here who are going to speak, each quite briefly. In fact, I've been told 20 minutes in total between them. So let's have uh, Councillor Mark Sally will speak first, followed here by Pete Dudley, then it's uh, Rob, and finally your MP, Andrew Saloon. So if I let them speak first, in order, and then after that I'll take questions and answers. But it is quite a packed meeting, so we'll have to be, as I say, fairly well disciplined. Thank you very much. Good evening, everyone. <coughs> if you can't hear, tell me as I start to speak. Hopefully everyone can hear. Um, can we also have a slide, please, whoever's in charge of the slides? Because our first one will be helpful to tell you who we are and what we do. Good. Okay, thank you for bearing with us in the lateness of the start time. I really wanted to get as many people here tonight. Um, as it happens, we've got far more than we ought to have in terms of uh, capacity and planning. We also made a point of asking, uh, as often as we could, in every communication that we made, that you book before you come, for, to avoid this eventuality. Um, nevertheless, I hope everyone who wanted to be here tonight is in the room. Can I start by thanking All Saints Academy uh, for having us here tonight. We did realise that we needed a bigger venue, um, and I'm grateful to them for hosting us. Um, and as I say, for, for you bearing with us for the lateness of the start. I've been keen to hold a meeting like this because I want to listen to as many people as I can, particularly parents, but of course teachers and governors, many of whom I've already met uh, in the last few weeks and months. Uh, and this is as much your opportunity uh, this evening to uh, talk to me and for me to listen to you as much as, as it is for my opportunity and the council to explain to you and, and to um, inform you as to how the decisions are being made. I've been particularly keen to have this meeting for quite a while because there is quite a bit of misunderstanding and misinformation in the community. And I know that personally, I have received emails which are um, inaccurate and not based on the fact. So I hope as we go forward this evening, um, and as we have our discussion, particularly in the Q&A, the question and answers later on, that we, um, through the presentation, come to an agreed understanding, a level of understanding that each of us has about what a local authority is able to do compared to what it used to be able to do some years ago, in fact not that many years ago what individual schools are proposing to do, and it is the school's proposals, not the council's, that's another difference. Uh, and once we've got that common understanding and that uh, uh, an agreement about what is possible, what the new reality of school organisation is, then I hope we can have that question and answer uh, in a productive uh, way. Um, I want to emphasise another point as well, which is that I for maintain schools and the decision maker, but I am not the proposer, the council is not the proposer of either uh, decisions or proposals that have been made in the past, as we made some last year, or the ones out at the moment, or indeed ones coming up uh, in the future. So please remember, if, that, if there's one thing that I can ask you to remember tonight uh, from my speech, it's that the uh, proposals come from the school, the decision was made by the council, by myself. I also want you to know that, um, and I say this as a parent myself with children in the uh, Central Bedfordshire school system, uh, I'm here to listen, um, but I'm also uh, 
I've also had a number of meetings with schools and listened already to many of the teachers and governors, some of which, some of whom are here tonight. Uh, so I want you to feel assured that I'm, uh, the role that I'm in this evening is to listen, to not prejudice myself in saying anything that may suggest to you that I've already made up my mind about a proposal. Some are out there at the moment. Uh, and it's important that I keep an appropriate distance from coming to a decision too early. There's a process that needs to be followed, and I'm sure you will understand my position uh, in saying that. Uh, finally, before I hand over to Pete Dudley, um, if you have any particular concerns about any of the proposals uh, that are out there at the moment, or indeed may come forwards, it's very important that you feed, as individuals, your concerns, your questions into those consultation processes. Uh, it's for the, uh, and for the full governing body of those schools to then consider your questions and your concerns. And that's the way the process works and it has to work. And then when a decision comes to me, a proposal comes to me, I will look to see if and how concerns of parents have been addressed by the school proposing a change to its age range. Okay, so I hope that's been helpful to everyone to understand who does what and how the process works. Uh, and with that, uh, Pete, if you'd like to start. Good evening. Um, and well, I think that we're probably getting on to 400 people here. And uh, thank you all very much for coming. And apologies for the, uh, for the delay getting in and starting. I just want to spend about five minutes to seven minutes really setting out the context um, for the council and for schools in terms of the way that policies have changed and how that is affecting um, the, what, what we're all about here tonight, which is the provision of education in Dunstable. Uh, first of all, there was an attractive um, The, um, so Mark has been through this, it's about, it's about explaining how the changes affect schools and academies to explain the council's role in relation to that and how, how that affects the provision of school places in the area. Okay, so first of all, um, 2009, Central Bedfordshire Council started as a new council. And the council and schools, both governors and head teachers and teachers, developed a very strong vision for education in the new council area. And the principles for the, that vision are set out in the italic um, bullet points there. And they are passionately held by schools. Um, and they create a context <coughs> where uh, as children move from school to school, whether that's from lower to middle, from middle to upper, or through other forms of transition, there is a single learning journey. There's continuity of provision, a 0 to 19 experience. And you will see that there are some very other, some other very important um, principles there around the schools being based around the communities and their needs, around what's best for children and their families, and as far as possible, services are delivered locally. In 2010, uh, a year after the council started, there was a general election, the coalition government came in, and a year after that, the, um, the council also had an election. And that led to, those all brought about some changes in policy. And the outcome of the review in Dunstable and Hampton Regis um, was announced in May 2011 with the council stating its commitment to the new coalition's government, government's education policy uh, by encouraging schools to take advantage of the freedoms available to them to, to seek structural changes. Very briefly, um, there have been some changes in policy which make the relationship between schools and council very different. Um, first of all, there is increased school diversity, and above all, uh, since this government has, has begun, we have a, a position where schools can apply to become academies. But we've also got other forms of schools, 
um, university technical colleges. We have an alternative provision free school uh, opening in September, which has been set up by uh, head teachers of the upper schools and the council. There's much greater accountability for governing bodies for school standards. Schools are much more independent of the council. Academies are accountable to the Secretary of State, not to the council. But with that, we've also got schools working together um, far more than perhaps has happened in the past. And communities and parents having a much greater say in their school's future, as the Council of the Science has been saying. The Council's medium term plan priority is to still to raise attainment in schools. And the Council will support schools who want to make changes um, to bring those changes forward, but then apply the decision making criteria following consultation. The Council's role with schools, again, is very different from how it was two or three years ago and certainly 25 years ago. Now, the Council's role is to challenge under performance, it's to broker effective school to school support. Um, schools, good schools, helping schools that need support when they need it. Where necessary, intervening to prevent failure and to broker success by bringing schools together. To ensure, and if necessary, to, uh, if necessary, to protect children's education, even to close a school. To ensure every child has a school place throughout the changes and to coordinate admissions to schools and academies. The council is also the ultimate employer of, um, of, of, of a school staff in its, in its own schools. Okay. Um, just a brief mention about the change that the education policy has had. It's led to, it's led to this diversity, but it is also very much focused on on school standards. So we can see here the current standards in the Dunstable area, the standards in the Central Bedfordshire area. Dunstable is the dark blue, Central Bedfordshire is the light green, and the standards nationally. And on the far left, you've got standards for seven year olds in reading. Uh, in the middle, you've got standards for 11 year olds in the national measure of uh, English and, and Latin level four and above. And on the far right, you've got standards for 16 year olds, which is the 5A stars to see uh, GCSE. So you can see that while at seven, um, standards are above national, uh, by 16, standards are quite a long way below national. Now, the autonomy and independence of schools is a a big feature of education in England. Uh, England has the most devolved school system, uh, state school system in the world, and it's been a feature um, of, of education in England under successive governments. Since 2010, as I've said, so schools can apply to the Economy Academy and are then accountable to the Department of Education and not to the Council, and academies have much greater flexibilities, which include uh, varying the curriculum, use of uh, flexibilities around use of finances, also the ability to change age ranges and make structural changes. So, in order to enable council schools to make similar changes, the council considers proposals from locally maintained schools who want to make those uh, changes themselves and applies the, the, the criteria. I'm going to hand over to my colleague Rob Parsons, who's just going to give you some details about specific schools, about numbers of schools in the children in schools that are academies, so you can see just how much the picture has changed. Right, what I've tried to do here is set out for you a slide that illustrates the extent of schools that have already converted or aim to convert to academy status in central Bedfordshire to realise the freedoms and autonomy uh, of academy status that Pete has just outlined. So as you can see, 63% of all of our pupils um, anticipated by September of this year, uh, and that's based on those that have converted or have, or have applied to become an academy. So a significant take up. Of, of that opportunity already. Uh, in terms of Dunstable and Hampton Regis area, of the 33 schools 
in the area. We currently have 12 that have converted to become <coughs> academies and uh, one special school uh, at the bottom there, Weatherfield, uh, which is also uh, converted to take up those three years. So looking at that on the map, uh, this is a, a map of schools in the area, including uh, those schools that have stated an intention to convert to academy status. So as you can see, even across this area, a significant take-up, uh, bearing in mind the amount of time that the academy flexibilities have been available to, to schools. Um, Important point to note that in terms of age range alone, there is already a significant diversity of provision offering choice that I accept also daunting to parents and carers when it comes to making choices about your, your, your children's education. Um, across the piece, we already have a significant uh, range of diversity of choice, uh, and adding to that list will be a, a 9 to 19. Uh, school in the Eastern District that will be commissioned to provide new school places in the uh, Stockholm and Arsi area for central membership. So, in terms of making changes to age ranges, as P. Councillor Vasali had set out, fundamentally it is the governing body of a school that drives that change, that proposal. Um, Proposals can come forward from all of those different categories of school up at, at, at the top, depending on whether they're a council maintained school, which are all of those except academies. Um, we actually follow a legal process that requires the government body to consult with you as parents and a wider group of stakeholders for a six week period. And at the end of that first period, the governing body will sit down and decide on the balance of the responses that it's had to date whether it wants to step forward and take that proposal forward or perhaps to rethink it and amend it and consult again with you on, a, on an amended proposal before bringing it forward. If they choose to continue with that proposal that on balance is the right thing, that it has significant amount of support, they will publish legal notices and at that point <coughs> the number is ticking, Councillor Vassalian will inevitably have to make a decision at the end of the process to approve it, to reject it, perhaps to amend the proposal itself. Where decisions, uh, where proposals are brought forward for academies, it is a slightly different process. It's an eight-week consultation process without a break in the middle. But fundamentally, the academy is still responsible in charge of that. Their board uh, uh, governors or, or um, is, is responsible for undertaking uh, a decision at the end of that process to decide whether it wants to stick with the proposal if it's made, submit that to the Secretary of State for a decision. The local authority is a consultee in the process with academies. Right, so where the proposals relate to uh, council maintained schools, so all other types of schools other than, other than an academy, there are a range of factors which Councillor Vassalian as the decision maker will have to consider at the, at the end point of the, uh, of, the, of the process. But these are factors, crucially, which the governing body, and we publish guidance for Council Maintain Schools to set this out clearly, these are factors that the governing body have to set out with absolute clarity what the ultimate aim to the proposal they're making and what the impact will be across all of these headings. Right, academies, as you can see, there is a similar list of factors which the <coughs> Department for Education will consider at the, end of, at the end of the process. So where the academy wants to take forward that proposal and submit it to the Secretary of State for decision, their business case must set out with absolute clarity uh, these, the answer to these factors, how <coughs> that proposal will impact on each of these elements. <coughs> So, in terms of current age range of schools in Dunstan and Howard, I thought it would be useful for you to have a slide because these changes have come about relatively quickly. And that just Sorry, excuse me, could you move up a bit? I can't see you. can't see you. I don't know. Is it possible to move the slide up a little? 
No, it's not. <laughs> I will, I will read them out to you. I will read them. Oh. We're, going, we're, going, we're going to make a presentation available to all of you via the website after the meeting anyway. But let me read them out for you to can't see. So on the, uh, on the left hand side at the top are those schools which are council uh, maintained schools which have brought forward proposals. Exactly the process that I outlined a second ago that Council of Asalian has determined and approved. So, Hawkham Park, Thornhill Side Farm, Thomas Whitehead, Alton Rivers, and St Mary's uh, Paddington to become primary schools in 2013. Schools currently, governing bodies of schools that are currently consulting are those on the bottom left hand side Kensworth Lower, Ashton St Peter's, Langcott Lower, Ashton Middle, and Mantip Upper. And if those governing bodies choose to bring forward those proposals to the second stage, if they consider the outcome of the first stage and still want to go forward with that proposal, Council of Asylum will be the decision maker on August the 13th of this year. On the right hand side are academy uh, consultations and approvals. So All Saints, the building that we're in this evening, Eton Gray, uh, Hadrian, St Christopher's and Farnfield Vale all approved by the Secretary of State to become secondaries and primaries 2013. On the bottom right hand are the consultations which are currently underway and all business cases which have already been submitted to the Secretary of State at conclusion of that consultation process. So how we just middle to become secondary from uh, September 2013. Queensbury Upper. Primary, primary Middle is a 1916, Hill Lower, March Wide Lower, and St Augustine's Lower to become primary. And all of those bottom ones are to become, are to implement from 2014. Okay. On a map, this is what it looks like. <coughs> so what I've tried to do here is illustrate the potential pattern and age ranges of schools and academies in the area. And it shows approved primary schools with a dot. So those are the purple ones with a dot. And the purple ones without a dot are those which are currently at a stage of consultation. Okay. Uh, lower schools, again, you can see in the middle there. So you can see primary school. <coughs> Uh, in the centre, the Dunstable, Ickneald and Watling. Um, working with Studham at the bottom, uh, around the model to perhaps become a, and deliver a 916 model. Um, Slip Ender working very closely with Paddington. Uh, as you can see, uh, just next to Paddington Golf Club, on the, on the map there is Manshead's current proposal, so without a dot and not approved, um, with Shrewfield Middle behind it, and unfortunately there's a, there's a purple dot behind that without, with a dot, which is St Mary's um, Paddington, which is yeah, approved. So hopefully that just goes some way to illustrate uh, the evolving pattern of provision uh, across the field. Now, as Pete outlined a second ago, the authorities still retain a range of statutory duties of ensuring that there is clarity for you as parents and carers, and clarity for governing bodies who want to bring forward these types of proposals. We publish a range of data. The link is there uh, on the Central Bedfordshire website, and you can access admissions data, admissions data on starting school or transfer, in-year admissions data, um, processes and guidance around how you can appeal uh, your, your uh, allocated school place, historical data on the relative popularity of different schools, whether they're oversubscribed or not, um, in, information specifically for the Dunstable and Houghton Regis area provides a bit of a flow chart and a map with you on the various choices that you can make from transfer of one type of school to, to another in each, in each, um, in each age, uh, age range. Uh, you can also access the kind of performance that Pete outlined on uh, performance data on schools, uh, information on the number of pupils in each school, pupil forecast, progress of schools, <coughs> change of category to academic status, etc. There's a lot of information on there uh, for parents and for uh, schools. I just 
just want to make um, a few points. I'm obviously, as a member of parliament, I'm not part of the Central Bedfordshire Council. Um, the, the first thing to say is that I recognise uh, that change causes considerable anxiety for parents, for children, for governors, and for teachers, and I recognise that, and that is not good. And I think that we need to try and achieve certainty um, as quickly as possible as far as Dunstable schools are concerned. Um, to get certainty, we, we can, I don't think it will be possible to have a situation where every school will, will be happy. I, I, I think we have to accept that. But I think it's really important, albeit, like I said, we have to go through statutory processes and they take a certain period of time. But I think we need urgently to work towards certainty in Dunstable, uh, given the, the, the remaining question marks that there are. As a Member of Parliament for South West Bedfordshire, there is a big contrast that I see between Houghton Regis, Leighton Buzzard and Dunstable. Because all the schools got together in Houghton Regis and they decided themselves that they wanted to move to a primary, secondary, two-tier model. And they came up with their own solution for the whole town, which they presented to the Director of Education at Central Bedfordshire Council. If I look at Leighton Buzzard, where they have a very cohesive learning community. I think they actually employ a paid administrator for the whole learning community. They have decided, all the schools together and as a town, to stay in the three-tier system, lower, middle, and upper. Not every head teacher in Lake and Buzzard wants that. I know that for a fact. I know some would like to change. But they have decided, as a town, to stick together. So it's not an issue. Lake and Buzzard, three-tier. How can we just moving completely to two-tier? The regret to me is that there has not been that degree of cooperation and collaboration looking at what is best overall for children in Dunstable. And I think that's a pity. It's not too late for it to happen. And I think we need to think tonight as to how we might enable that to happen. Now, I've said to some of the schools, this is just an idea, it's a proposal, that maybe we find a retired head teacher who would have the respect of the schools in Dunstable, not from the area, so they have no, uh, no bias towards any preferred solution, but just to look across the whole of Dunstable at what is best for the future of Dunstable, given some of these changes have already happened, are going to happen, and I think we all perhaps get a sense of where this is beginning to go. But there are loose ends, and that relates to the uncertainty, with which I mentioned at the beginning. Now, I'm happy to help in any way I can. I've taken count with Council of Sally in the past, up to see the Academy's minister when there were particular issues over some of the lower schools wanting to become primaries who didn't think they'd have the capital funding to build years five and six classrooms. We managed to solve that. I'm happy to you know, take Council of Sally or any of the officers from Central Bedfordshire up to the Department for Education to iron out these issues. I'm happy to you know, be part in any meeting if the schools agree and the governors agree perhaps if, to see if we could find a retired head teacher who might come in to try and broker some sort of dunstable wide solution. The last thing I'll say is this is an area which I genuinely believe is on the up. It's got a lot of good things going to happen. We are going to have a lot of expansion in the next few years. There'll be 6,000 plus houses built just to the north of here. Uh, a lot of new jobs coming to the area. Bypass starting next year. So if you, know, if you are a bright teacher, a good teacher at a school in Dunstable, this area absolutely has a future to offer you. you know, it may not be in the same school you're in now, there may not be the same plaque on the door, but I think if we look for a Dunstable-wide solution, you know, it is possible to keep good teachers, but I do think that we need to end the, the uncertainty as quickly as possible, even though it's not possible that we're going to make everyone happy by doing that. Okay, you've heard what they've got to say. Now it's your turn to ask questions. Now there's a couple of things I want to just make. First of all, there is a lot of you here, so if you could keep the questions succinct, that would help. Secondly, if you could give your name and the school you represent or your children attend, that would also help. But can I ask now for people if they want to ask questions? Okay, yes, you. Yeah, hi there. Hello.
ways of doing educational change. And I think those principles that were on that slide that came from the schools themselves, I'm sure we will sign up to. You've heard that the role of the council is fundamentally different, and that many of the schools are academies and are not within the council's control. What we have, what happens with change of any kind of like this? I've seen school reorganisation happen in different ways, whether it's top down, led by a council, or by, um, or, or, or by a group of councils, or whether it's bottom up. You get uncertainty, as people have said, you get concern, you get anxiety because of the uncertainty. Um, you can get with a top down approach, you can have schools who have uncertainty and the threat over them for years before that part of the plan comes to that particular area. And that itself can have a hugely detrimental effect. Good people will leave because they see opportunities elsewhere, they're worried about the future of their school. Um, there are usually successive appeals to different authorities to make sure that, to try and affect the change in what's been arranged. You get uncertainty, you get a long period of time, and in the end, you get something that has been reached through one set of processes. What we have here is not dissimilar. However, what, I, what I'm seeing is that, as, and as we've just heard from colleagues uh, on the panel, schools are working... Did you hear the lady's hard. question? Yes, I did hear the lady's question, and I'm giving the answer. The answer is that the schools themselves are working out solutions which will work best for their localities, for their parent groups, for their no, children. We work better. Oh, 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 come on this. We're asking for questions, and I said we needed a bit of discipline. So if you want to ask a question, put your hand up and you can ask. If you want to come back, if we, if we don't we'd have like any questions. We'd like the answer. Come on. We're not going to have you shouting out for the audience. No one's going to get anywhere, are we? Yeah, sorry. What we are doing is meeting frequently with, with head teachers, with governors, in order to broker those discussions between schools. And the, the speed of change is at least as swiftly as it would be if it was a centrally organised old-fashioned um, organisations we cannot now do for the reasons stated. Okay, if you want to come back, come in. Yeah. Yeah, about eight years ago, this all came up before, and I think that you'll find that most, at that time, most of the schools weren't accounted, so it could have been done differently because you weren't you know, dealing with different things. And the other thing is, I wouldn't ask any head teacher to say, but I think that there's a possibility that a lot of schools have become academies to protect yeah. 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 Have you said what you wanted to say? Okay, the lady there would like to ask a question, yes. Hello, my name's Karen Manning. I've got a child at Pyrie and a child at Queensbury. Um, I would just like to say a very well done to all the teachers in Dunstable and the, the head teachers and everyone that's been working because, as the lady says, They've been so busy thinking about if they're going to get left behind being academies or not being academies. I think they've worked very hard to, to see what is best for their school. My concern is, is for the children, they like continuity. There's no continuity with some staying primary, some staying middle. So where, where is the continuity for the children? My child is in a situation where I'm very happy with where they are at the moment. But are they going to get left behind if they don't go to one school because they're going to take from the age of 11? How can you guarantee that our children are going to get the continuity when everyone's doing different things at the moment? Do you want to answer that? Or, uh, you always say, don't, that's always you. Why can't you have them all go at the same time? Yeah. 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 If the school These kinds of organisations you know, will never cool. happen overnight and will always have to be done on a rolling programme basis. If the council could do it, which of course half the schools, not, or more than half the schools, uh, not council schools, isn't possible. It has to be done through local uh, discussions and, and, and of, of the kind we've been hearing about. Uh, in terms of how we protect ch children's journeys through that, that is happening, I can take you back to the principles devised by heads and schools to ensure that there is curricular continuity, that if a child moves from one school to another school and then on to another, um, whether those schools are middles, middles becoming primaries, 
uh, uppers, lowers, that there is curricular continuity and the children make the good progress as they transit, as they transfer from one to the other. So that commitment to a 0 to 19 seamless learning journey has been there with the schools from the outset of Central Bethesda. I'm, I'm not disputing that the teachers wouldn't do that transfer because they do it very well, but it's they need support with, with this from from the council, and I don't think they've got okay. it. Okay, well, Mark is from the council, so perhaps he can have a word. <coughs> yeah. I'm sent to the council as well by the people of Bedfordshire. Uh, that's the distinction between myself and, and uh, the civil servants here tonight. Just two points. The, what I didn't want to do, I was appointed to this job two years ago, May 11. Uh, and what I didn't want to do before I got there and certainly when I got into the office was to mandate the change. All 25 middle schools in central Bedfordshire will be closed or will not be closed, whatever the solution may have been. The reason I say closed is because that's what Suffolk have done and are still doing, as well as other places, Isle of Wight, etc. Well, I would like to just spend a moment on Suffolk. And whether your middle school, as an example, is good performing or bad performing, poorly performing, you are being closed if you're a Suffolk middle school, whether you like it or not. And I felt as a politician that was wrong, as a policy, as a principle of democracy and politics and let alone best practice. It was wrong for me to mandate that all 25 middles in Bedfordshire, central Bedfordshire, would close. So to answer your question, why not just do it in one big bang? Why not overnight make three tier into two tier? Well, one, because I felt as a principle and as a policy it was wrong, hopefully for the reasons I've given. Two, there's no consensus about which is better if we're candid. Uh, I mean, I wasn't on the council at the time, but I remember the time living in Bedfordshire in 2008 when the county council attempted to go through, uh, did go through the decision process and decided not to. <coughs> Uh, and that was painful and, and, and difficult, as I'm sure um, a lot of you here tonight remember, looking at the nods of heads. Uh, and now, in the new world that we're in, the third reason is that we are unable to, both legally and financially. If a school is an academy, the local authority does not have the ability that it once had to close that school. Uh, we are no longer the only uh, player if you like, in that market, in that we're not, we're not the only decision maker in that issue. So, and that's what I mean about this, this common level of understanding that we share tonight. But you have to appreciate, as I do continually, I can't just pull a lever from Chipsands, head office, and something happens, because it depends. <coughs> the final point uh, I'd like to mention, and this relates to Suffolk, to draw a comparison with Bedfordshire. Suffolk, whilst it's gone through this change, even though it's a change done in a different way. We're not doing one size fits all, we're letting local solutions emerge, and I think that's right. Whilst Suffolk have gone through this change, their key stage two, so the middle school results, have taken a beating and have gone down significantly. You may have noticed, uh, and there are many places you can find the results of the 25 middle schools in Central Bedfordshire, including CBC's website, that our results went up. Now, some might say that's despite, not because of the change. Uh, I'm, I'm not precious about which view you take personally, but our results, for example, have gone up 14% in one year alone at Key Stage 2, uh, whilst we're going through this turbulence. So I would also uh, like to you know, uh, join with you in giving my thanks to the Dunstable head teachers for those results, as well as the many other results at Lower and Upper. Uh, so there are some interesting facts that, that we ought to establish when we, when we decide what is the motivation for some of these proposals. Not my proposals or the council's, but proposals from schools and their governing bodies who are uh, the people just as much as you or I are. They're not mandarins in Whitehall. These are local people from the community serving on a governing body and taking a view that it's best for their school to change its age range or change its tier. Okay, yes, I've got a lady here wanting to speak, and then the gentleman at the back there. If you both, both speak yeah. before we get another. Yeah. Okay. My name's Susan Lucas, I'm a parent of two children, one in year two and one in year four at Lambert Lower School. Um, partly answer your question there. My concern is that I feel council are absolving all responsibility, yes. and they are creating this wave of uncertainty by not making a decision. That's my opinion. 
gentleman there, yes, yes. Wayne Mitchell from Ashton Middle School. You would have, Wayne Mitchell from Ashton Middle School. You would appear from the um, data which you showed earlier on that the middle school for the results at age seven and the results at age eleven are quite comparable with the national average, whereas it then seems to drop off by the time we get to the upper school. And yet it seems as though that decisions made by the upper schools are having detrimental effects on the middle and lower schools. Sorry, have you made your point? My point is, how can that be, how can that be reasonable oh, that I think middle and lower that. schools are being affected by, I'm not going to say failure, but by Increased quite dramatically, so they, they go up and down. Um, Central Bedfordshire's middle school results are improving. They should, according to the predictions from the lower schools, be considerably higher than they are now. And um, the same goes for others. You've only considered English and maths, there's lots of other subjects. Okay, come on, come on now, come on. If you want to speak, you can put your hand up. Come on. It's not just English and maths. We heard. That, I mean, that's last year, April, May, June time. Uh, the local authority has a duty, uh, morally and legally, to provide uh, provision uh, for pupils who are um, taken out of the school for one reason or another, such as expulsions. And the uh, local authority um, took the view that this would be better provided, uh, or there was an opportunity to provide it, uh, in a more effective way by creating this new school. It, the, uh, was the, gentleman there? the two million pounds you mentioned sounds like the value of the real estate. So uh, there's a school called uh, Rowcroft. Uh, the old Rowcroft school site, as we call it, uh, was valued at around two million pounds real estate value. And we've given that to the uh, free school, which is essentially the ten upper schools, um, uh, one or two middles and some others, some specialist schools such as Oakbank as well, who collectively run that themselves. So when you expel a child from one of the ten uppers, you know one of the other heads in the room is going to receive that child. And that was the logic behind them running that service on their own and, and me taking, or us taking ourselves out of that decision-making process. So that's the two million pounds. It wasn't cash, it was a building. We, we simply don't have cash. Um, what we do have, if, but just to illustrate this point, because this is where it gets, sometimes can get uh, complicated, if there is a need for a child to receive an education in the area, in other words, a child moves in or is born, there isn't provision 
somewhere, then this local authority has to resource that. It has to pay for that. Uh, and if that means expanding or building new schools, then that's what we do all the time. And currently we're, um, over five years, spending £104 million. Pounds. Uh, and the free school is one example of that, where we can give a couple of million pounds because we need to pay for the education of children. We need to make sure there's a seat in a classroom for them somewhere in the county, somewhere in the central Bedfordshire. So that's the answer to that particular, uh, to that particular one. Pete, can I ask you to take the staff question? Staff development and training for um, staff a constant and ongoing um, focus for schools. We have teachers currently in Bristol and Hampton Regis teaching the children who are here. And if classes of those children that might have been in one school appear in another school, that doesn't mean that one person has to stop teaching and another person has to start. If you think about it, there, there's plenty of opportunity for, there will be plenty of opportunities for um, teachers within the moves that are happening. Having said that as well, one of the biggest changes that we're seeing at a national level as well as, as across the country within schools and local authorities is the move towards teachers doing their professional development and learning how to teach more effectively in the context of their schools and in their classrooms rather than going off somewhere to train. And that makes perfect sense because you go off somewhere to train and you come back and you then got to remember what you learned and apply it in the classroom. If you're working in your school, on the job, you will learn more quickly. And in Central Bedfordshire, we have a highly effective partnership of schools, um, the Central Bedfordshire Teaching School Partnership, whose role it is to do this. And at the same time as this is happening, we are also witnessing a new national curriculum coming on screen. So schools across Central Bedfordshire and the rest of England will be getting to grips with that. So it's a, in many ways, you could say, it's an ideal time for this to happen. Okay, I've got a gentleman against the wall there and then a lady just here. Thank you. My name is uh, Des Tinch. I'm the deputy, or one of the deputies at Stringer Middle School. Right, I get it. The council don't have any control over what's going on. It's a mess in Dunstable. What are we going to do to fix it? I challenge every single head teacher sitting here to gather around the table and to take up Mr. Salou's solution. Get somebody else in to grow for this bid. What a waste of talent. What a waste of money. We've got schools spending money building new classrooms when the classrooms are already available in all the other middle schools. We've got people so much Raising school standards. And I can 
saying that I share your doubt, but I, I, I accept some responsibility from the previous county council and the current authorities that school standards are not good enough. So kids only get one chance to education. Now, I've, I've said um, quite publicly, my position has always been, is that I'm full square behind the consultation that uh, Manstead had put out. I think Manstead should be in secondary school. And I think, as, as Andrew Saloon said, that change is never easy, but change is inevitable locally. And the quicker we can get this through, and the quicker we can get things settled down, the better. But I have a simple challenge tonight uh, for the two governing bodies, and I'm a governor of neither school, at uh, Manstead and at uh, Streetfield. Now, this may not be a popular challenge, but I'm going to make it anyway, because we can't change where we are. We are where we are. But the challenge to those two government bodies is very straightforward. Is that you need to sit down now and work out the right way forward for both schools. We cannot continue as we are. Now, the solution I would like to see... Why not? ...is a single secondary school. Why not? 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 I would like to see a single yeah. on both sides. Now, that is not going to go down well with Streetville. I know it's not. And in some respects, I feel slightly sorry for Streetville because this is a situation not of their making. Streetville has done a great job. I've got huge respect for Angela. <laughs> Do nothing is not an option. And that's the challenge I would issue to both governing bodies. Thank you, Jen. Do you want to come back to this before I take anyone else? Can I? Can I? I've been issued the direct challenge. My name is Don Brown. I'm the Chair of Governors of Springfield Middle School. Today, he very kindly emailed me to say that he was going to answer that, he was going to ask that question here in this hall tonight. And he knows what my response was. I will, and we will, always sit down and talk to anyone who respects us, our parents, and the decisions that they make. And that isn't happening at the moment. We entered into a thing called partnership, learning partnership. Okay? Now, my view of partnership is that you take on board the views that others have. You may not agree with them. You take them on board and you discuss and you work a way forward. Now, as part of that learning partnership, we at Streetfield would have got involved in any discussions, but instead of that being a focus on education and on learning and on teaching, it became a focus on changing. And it's become an all I'm all right Jack situation now, in that all the other schools are and have made proposals to go forward without a consultation with us that leave us in a position where actually there is no partnership, okay? We consulted our parents. We didn't go to our parents and say, this is what we think the idea should be. We went to our parents and said, what do you want to do? And they have overwhelmingly said, we'd like you to stay as a middle school. Not only that, we'd like you to stay as a middle school within the learning, within the local authority remit. And that's what we will try and do. Now, added to that, I feel really, really sorry for the middle school within the Ashton Foundation section. Because you have a secondary school now proposal and a primary school now proposal without any thought, without any <coughs> idea of the consequence and impact on the middle school within that foundation. Yeah.